nutrition and mTOR I'd like to talk about. Um, so we talked about rapamycin and rapologues and how they can inhibit mTOR1. And, um, and in fact, we talked a little bit about before that you know it's an AND gate, so we should be able to in inhibit it. So if the idea was that we wanted to inhibit or downregulate mTOR1, you know, what would the kind of best diet, the optimal diet for that be? Yeah, th this is a very hard question. And, uh, and I think we have to be upfront that we don't know, right? And, and, and we don't fully know. I'll tell you what, what I think, but we don't fully know. And the simple reason is that we don't have a good way of measuring mTORP1 activity in vivo in specific tissues in an intact organism. We don't, right? And so in the absence of that, the, the best we can do is extrapolate from animals um, where we can do some, you know, some version of that experiment, but not in real time. Of course, you have to sacrifice. Currently, we have to sacrifice an animal to be able to look at mTORP1 activity across multiple tissues. That's the, that's the, the easiest and the best way of, of doing an experiment there. So given what I said, right, that the pathway senses many upstream signals, you would say, okay, well, let's remove one of those signals and we're gonna inhibit mTORP1. And so, and I think in general, that's a, that's a true statement. And so I think the two large classes of signals that we would want to remove, right? I don't think we wanna become hypoxic for example, that, that obviously right, has other issues. I don't think we want to massively alter our body temperature or our osmolarity, right? We, we can't do things that are going to kill us for other reasons, right? Our osmolarity of our blood is kept in a small range, our temperature. So, so we have to throw those away. So I think what we can do is we can change the nutrients, right, that we consume, and we can try to change the growth factors that are made in many cases in response to those nutrients, right? So, so if I had to then, again, step back from that statement and say, okay, big picture, what are we going to manipulate? I would say they're amino acids, right? It's very clear that mTORP1 responds to amino acid content of our food. We, we've been doing a lot of work in, in that space. Not, not, all, not a lot of it's published yet, but it's clear that the amount of amino acids in the food can directly impact mTORP1. And the other one is insulin, right? In response to glucose. Uh, glucose is sensed by mTORP1 through many pathways, directly through a glucose metabolism pathway, but also through the production of insulin by the pancreas. So, and then the, the question becomes more complicated because certain tissues will care more about one input than another, right? So for example, we have evidence that the liver cares more about the nutrients themselves, at least early on in response to eating than the insulin that's in response to nutrients. So long-winded way of saying is that probably low glucose diets, low carbohydrate diets that keep insulin low will keep mTOR1 pretty low in most tissues. Diets also that are low in amino acids can keep uh, mTOR1 low. So, so what are you left with, right? If you have low amino acids, low carbs, you, know, you could eat a very high fat diet that has other issues in terms of cardiovascular health and atherosclerosis. So I think at the end, it's, it's not that complicated. It's the kind of diets that many people have been honing in are, which are sort of high complex carb diets, right? So not simple carbohydrates, carbohydrates that take a long time to digest, right? You know, complex grains and certain vegetables that because they take a long time to digest, your glucose level never goes very high in your blood and therefore your insulin doesn't go very high. Remember at the end of the day, a pathway like mTORP1 is probably sensing the area under the curve of insulin, right? It's, it's not probably detecting, you know, you could detect spikes and stuff, but overall you care about that total integrated activity. So, so a diet in which insulin will be secreted at low amounts and therefore never go very high, sort of a, you know, a diet where you're really maintaining glucose levels in a narrow range is probably the, the best. Um, now, we don't, obviously we don't, we don't have experiments that directly test that. Um, coupled with a low protein diet. Um, some of this will also depend on where you are in your life, right? With el older people, it's clear that a little more protein is probably good for muscle health, right? Or you, you need to do protein synthesis, keep muscle health up. And so, you know, th this is going to be a balance between inhibiting mTORP1, but not perturbing other processes that will matter as well for health. Right. So keeping, yeah, keeping low blood glucose, I mean, that that's pretty much anti-diabetes, that's pretty much everywhere. Um, so, but you, you would 
So low protein as well. I mean, if we have too much protein, does it, yeah, yeah does it overexpress mTOR or it just kind of gets worse? Well, that already, I mean, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about nutrients, of course, is that you can't, unlike a mutation or a drug, a nutrient can only activate mTOR1 as much as that pathway is built to, right? It, it's not that, that, you know, the pathway has a receptor for that nutrient. And, and once that receptor is occupied, well, it doesn't matter if you put more nutrients in because, you know, there's no more receptor to sense that nutrient. So yes, when you, when you take a lot of protein, mTOR1 will be as high as it can be. Um, but it's not that you could drive it to the level of a mutation that you might find in cancer would happen, right? Because that one, you're, there you're breaking a pathway. The regulatory mechanisms are broken. A nutrient can only operate within the regulatory framework that exists for that pathway. Um, but, but certainly keeping amino acids low, and, and this has been shown, right? Low, low protein diets are also associated with longevity, again, depending on where you are in your life. Um, so, so I think those are the two interventions that, that could be done. I think the other one, and I think a lot of people also practice this, so not, nothing that I'm saying here is profound in any way, is periods of fasting, right? So if, if autophagy is required, or at least important in the effects on longevity of mTORP1 inhibition, you need to really inhibit mTORP1 at some point. And, and, and perhaps the easiest way is to go into a fast, right? And, and the real question becomes, how long is that fast? And again, we don't really know in a human because we don't really have ways of measuring either mTORP1 or autophagy in a person doing a fast. Um, but many people think that somewhere in kind of an 18 hour range of a fast is, is good enough to inhibit mTORP1 and to promote autophagy. Uh, in a mouse, we know it's a lot less. You know, even a couple of hours of fasting of a, of a mouse will start to inhibit mTORP1. And the promoter talks, of course, were very different than a mouse. And we have a lot less, we have much more reserve on board than, than a mouse does. Right. So I was going to ask about um, intermittent fasting or calorie restriction, whether you had, you know, kind of comments on which one you think is more effective. Just, yeah. yeah you know, I am not sure at the end of the day whether they're that different, actually. I grew up thinking, I mean, grew up scientifically thinking they were that different. But if I start thinking about them again from the area under the curve, right? If I, the experiment I would love to do is in someone who's doing caloric restriction versus intermittent fasting, I would like to measure mTORP1 activity, let's say in a particular tissue, the liver, but we could pick any tissue, ideally all tissues. I like to measure mTORP1 activity in real time for one month. And then say, well, over a one month period, the calorically restricting person had X amount of mTORP1 activity, the cumulative mTORP1 activity, and the intermittent fasting person had Y amount of activity. I suspect that it's that total amount of mTORP1 activity that's what matters. Less than exactly whether mTORP1 was at 50% active for a certain period of time or 100% active and then 0% active. As long as we're never in those two extreme states for a long, long period of time, I think we're fine. So from that point of view, again, a long-winded answer, it's much easier to do intermittent fasting than caloric restriction. Caloric restriction requires a degree of calculation and sort of mental fortitude and thinking and planning that most of us simply can't do. Well, intermittent fasting is like, skip a meal, right? Yes. So, um, so I guess I am more a fan of the intermittent fasting model. Okay, excellent. Yeah, because that's what I do. So I'm, I'm happy. Um, so, yeah. but one question from that is you said like after 18 hours, you, you kind of, autophagy kind of starts, right? Now, we how imagine, long yeah. do I want, sorry? We, after, we imagine that somewhere, I, I would say somewhere in the 12 to 16, 18 hour range. And you know, it depends also how much reserves you have on board, how much you ate before. Or, right, there's a lot of variables here. Right. Um, so when that autophagy switches on, then, I mean, I want to keep it going for for some period of time. I mean, I, I assume it's like if it's on for one minute. It doesn't clean up my cell, right? It has to be on for some period. I, I mean, would, sure. would you? How quickly does the autophagy work? Do you, I, it's a difficult question. Yeah, I, you know, for, first place, none of these pathways are are on and off the way that we're describing them. 
right? And so what's really going to happen is that there, and you know, we have basal autophagy going on in ourselves all the time, right? So I think what you're going to do is you're going to start ramping it up, right? How long? I mean, you're, you're literally asking me something to guess, but, but I would imagine, you know, autophagy is much faster than people think, actually. We, we see it when we inhibit m one in, in culture, autophagy is activated really in, in a span of minutes, which I would not have guessed given that it's a complex machinery to trigger it. But I would imagine that you, you want it on for a couple hours. Right? It's, it's, it's in that range. So, so when I say 18 hours of fast, it, you, you probably have had it on for, at least at some level for a couple hours at that point. Right. But this all has to be taken with a grain of salt, right? No, no one really knows the answer to this. Right, yeah, I, that, that is a common theme, I guess, in longevity. It's like that nobody really knows. And, and we're, we're all trying to figure it out. Or, yes. So if you had, so, so if you had no pro, no protein, right, it, and so you were just having like a high carb diet, would, if there's no protein, like mTOR would not be activated or it would, yeah. Or would it find the, pro, scavenge the protein from somewhere else to make it inside your body? Yeah, that's a very good question too. And, and this shows why this is an hand gate. So what happens if you stop eating protein? Well, you know, your body needs protein, right? It needs amino acids to do all the things that tissues need amino acids for, most obviously to make protein. Well, you're going to start breaking down tissues to release protein through autophagy. You'll start breaking down muscle. You'll start breaking down liver. So what will happen if you stop eating protein? Yes, your amino acids will drop. But at some period of time after, they're going to come back up because you're going to be generating your own. Now, obviously, that's not a sustainable situation for a long period of time. Although, you know, in a large body, it's sustainable for a, a significant period of time. So, but in that situation, let's say you're fasting, your amino acids will start to come back up, but your insulin won't, right? Your insulin will remain relatively low. And so because mTORC1 is an AND gate, in most tissues, mTORC1 will remain inhibited in that situation. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, so we, we talked about amino acids, but we talked about them like in general, but um, I, I believe like leucine is maybe the most, the one that activates mTOR what most. Um, and so does like the amino acid, acid mix make a lot of difference? Yeah, I mean, I think all evidence suggests it does, right? So if, if we look at the amino acids that we find are the most important in cells and culture, they are leucine would be number one arginine would be number two, and probably methionine would be number uh, three. Um, uh, lysine also seems to have some role. Uh, so, so yes, I, I think, you know, if, if you're in a low protein diet and you're taking a lot of leucine, that might counteract a lot of the effects of a low protein diet. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I, I think m one and this is an interesting point, right? m one didn't evolve to sense all amino acids. And to some extent, that also makes sense because if you think about these, these are systems that evolved over hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. Natural sources of protein, right, of amino acid are based or proteins normally eating other organisms. And typically they're gonna have a full mix of amino acids, right? So, so you don't need to sense every amino acid. You need to sense some amino acids that tell you protein was there. And for whatever reason, and, and people debate this quite a bit for whatever that reason, you know, in terms of the reason that it is, leucine was picked as the most important amino acid to sense. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.